volume from the side. Everybody here? Everybody? Okay, cool. So, uh, my name is Victor, and I am going to be talking about a few small but useful libraries. Um, a few as in three. But, so the libraries I'm going to be talking about is Butterknife. Um, who here uses Butterknife? Pretty much everybody. Yeah, it's a pretty popular library. It's one of the most popular out there. Um, it's done by the people at Square, but I'll talk about it in a bit. Um, he uses some sort of type of event bus. So I'm talking about auto. He's Rx Java. That's just pretty much a replacement for it. Um, and then the support annotation library. This isn't a huge library, but I think it's really cool. So I was going to talk about it for a little bit. Um, it's kind of in the early stages, but as it progresses, I think it's going to progressively get um, cooler and cooler. Uh, cool. So first thing, butter knife. Um, it's created by Jake Wharton, who works at Square. He does pretty much every open source project you use. Um, people at Square are amazing. Um, it's been around, it's like version 7.0 right now. Um, I actually heard that Butterknife was initially created as a joke. I'm not sure what the joke was. Um, it's a good joke, though, because I use it all the time. So, <laughs> works for me. Um, um, okay, so what does Butterknife do for the people who don't use it? Um, it uses annotation for code generation, um, and it doesn't use reflection, so it's quick. Uh, and the main, the main way I like to think about Butterknife is uh, boilerplate reduction libraries. It removes code that you have to write, and it'll do stuff um, automatically for you. Um, another cool feature of it, it removes anonymous inner classes uh, for listeners just with views, so that's like your on-click listeners, on item selected listeners, a bunch of listeners that are associated with views. Um, any type of interaction really has a listener with it. Uh, that's what views are for. Uh, so it has um, some sort of handling for all that. Um, and it also does, uh, it simplifies its resource lookups. So when you want to do like, um, I don't know, like a drawable resource or integer resource, it will uh, make it a lot easier for you. So I'm going to run through kind of how you can use it and the range of using it. Um, so the first and mostly used, this one uh, it, it binds views to activities. Um, so this is what it looks like before Butterknife. So you have um, declare your text view field. Um, use the M or however you want to declare it. Um, it's just a base activity, just like Mark was talking about earlier. You set your content view. Um, it's just the view of the activity. And then you have to cast the text view. Type the dreaded find view by ID and then search the resource. So um, that's before Butterknife, but after um, you get something that looks like this. So you have this um, Butterknife class and you have this static method bind and you call this, which it um, uh, takes in the activity and it takes in all the views associated with the activity um, and it looks for these annotations. So um, to declare that same text view, all you have to do is uh, do the bind annotation um, with the text view ID, and then you declare it up here. So um, it removes a little bit of code in your onCreate method, which uh, makes uh, life a little bit easier. Um, makes so you can mainly focus on handling the view in your uh, methods rather than declaring them and having to handle it that way. Um, so you, there's not really a huge use right here. Uh, where, where it really becomes helpful is situations like this, where you have a bunch of text views, or any views, I don't have the text views, but um, uh, you have a bunch of views, because any activity will have a bunch of views, more than one. Um, so then you get this big mess of uh, find view of IDs, just a bunch of repeated code, and you declare it. Um, and then it becomes a pain, because it's just a big chunk of code in your onCreate method. Um, so you have to go all the way through, and then anytime you want to change anything, you have to go search it out. One of these many, many views, and just say you're changing a text view to a button, you got to recast it, and then you got to re-change whatever. So it's, it's a, you got to go a lot of places to do something very simple. Um, so what Butterknife does is it uses Butterknife, and it re and um, a lot of that code is gone, as this guy said. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that last two slides ago, um, turned into something that looks like this. So you add one uh, method to your, one call to your onCreate, and then you move everything up in, into the field. So um, you can declare your text views, all of them up here, you get them out of your onCreate method, so you can just 
worry about the business logic and all the good stuff um, later on in your code. Um, so yeah, so you can actually use this space to manipulate your views and um, um, add content to your views. Uh, and then this is really where the big areas where I find the most useful is when you do have these big round, big um, clumps of views and you can just kind of put them at the top of your class and just really not worry about them too much and just um, assume, assume it works. And if anyone has any questions throughout this, let me know, or any comments, people who use it a lot, just shout them out. Uh, so yeah, so you just do the simple unbind call and you can just run through all of them. Um, so it's, it's not just specific to activities. You can also bind views to objects. Um, so let me run through that. So uh, when you're using list views or recycle views, um, actually recycle view um, almost forces, but you, you use a view holder pattern, or it can be any class, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't really matter. Um, so the normal way of having, uh, declaring views in a class looks something really similar to activities. So you'll pass in the parent view, or you can either um, uh, inflate the parent view in here. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then it's very similar. You have to cast it, and you have to find the view within the parent view, so on and so forth. Um, uh, so after you do that, um, after you use butter knife, uh, it's about the same. Um, same solution. Uh, there's only one slight difference. Is uh, there's two fields now that you pass into bind versus one. Um, so what this means is this first uh, field is where the annotations are located. Um, in this class, it's located in view holder, so you just pass it this, or it doesn't have to be any object where the annotations exist. And then you need to pass the view that it's going to be searching for, uh, searching through. Um, so parent view, there is a text view and a text view to children within that parent view. Um, so that's where the actual view lives. Uh, that's the layout where the view lives. Um, so it'll, it'll know to link up the annotations to the view itself. So you can use it however you want. Um, and this is also very useful. I don't know if I have an example of it. Yeah. Uh, for fragments. So when you're using a fragment, you also have to do it the same way. Um, where on the, if you remember the on create view, um, you pass in the view that. Uh, is allocated there, and then you just pass this, and it's handled the same in fragments. Um, it's, even though it's a UI component, you still have to do it this way for uh, fragments. Um, so yeah, uh, pretty simple there. Just remember this butter knife bind call and the annotations up top, and it'll get you, get you all the way. Um, one of the cool parts I like about it is that you can bind listeners. Um, so before butter knife, if you wanted to create a simple on create listener, um, well, I guess you don't need the you don't need the global button right there. But um, so you you have to uh, find your button, um, play your button. Um, you can either do anonymous in your class, or you can um, have the activity implement the on click listener. Um, so option one is you can just draw your logic in here. Um, kind of chunky, kind of just taking a lot of space in your um, on create method. Uh, that can get kind of annoying, or you have to remember to call your set on click listener, then you have to um, implement the view on click listener to the activity, and then you have to have a method down here where you actually handle all the view um, events, all the click events. Um, so a lot of startup costs, a lot of um, unneeded steps that uh, Better Knife can fix. Uh, so what it looks like after is uh, um, a lot less code if you, well, I guess there was a little extra here, but um, so you don't need to ever uh, declare your uh, view anywhere. Um, you can just simply put the uh, ID of the button in the onClick annotation. Um, so this onClick annotation will um, handle all click events for uh, the views with this ID. Um, but and then this is a similar one-liner of butter knife dot bind this activity. Uh, same same applies for objects and fragments. <coughs> so yeah, so it's it's a very clean way that you can have a little section at the bottom of your activity or fragment or whatever that has all your click events, or you can locate wherever you want. Um, and you have to worry about writing a bunch of extra lines of code. Um, it makes your life a little bit easier. Um, and you can start doing some cool stuff with uh, 
uh, on-click listener and other view event listeners that I'll get into a little bit later. So you can have, you can, in the method, oh, let me go back. So, let me break this down a little bit. So you have the on-click annotation, you have the ID of the button, then you have this method name. This method name right here doesn't matter. It can be any method name that you want. Um, it's just, just for naming purposes, it, it won't recognize, it won't use that at all. It's just more of a, for your convenience, you, you use that. So what you can do um, with the parameters is you can actually uh, put the button itself as a parameter. So if you wanted to do some uh, manipulation of the view that you clicked, uh, you, you pass it in as a parameter. Uh, you can set the color, you can set the text, you can really do whatever you want uh, with that view. Um, all that's going to cost you is um, uh, just one parameter of the button. Um, I mean, it has to be the same type or a subclass of it, but that's it's pretty straightforward and expected. Um, <coughs> yeah. uh, no, the name of the parameter doesn't matter. Uh, all that matters is the um, what type of view it is. Um, and then, yeah. So I'm going to go, how am I going for that? Okay. For so you get to remove it or um no do you have to remove click listeners no no it, it does all that for you yeah it does all that so you yeah it doesn't I'm not sure how that works behind the scenes but um yeah so that's also so you don't have to worry about when an object's not visible anymore having to remove listeners you know. So yeah, any other questions? Am I going too fast? Am I going too fast? Uh, okay, so there's other things you can do with um, a click listener is in the on-click annotation, you can have multiple views come through. Um, so what you can do here is you can have multiple IDs, so just be listening for all four of those views. And then you can do um, some stuff accordingly. You can, uh, this is, and then in the click, you can filter out. You probably wouldn't want to do this. You probably just do separate on click listeners, but uh, you could filter out if the button was clicked, do this. Um, uh, yeah, so that way you can kind of group together common functionality and common clicks if you all want them to do the same thing. Um, it definitely uh, will make your life a little bit easier in that situation. Um, Another cool scenario you could do with this is if you have multiple custom views that have some sort of state attached to it, um, you can check if the button clicked um, is in the state you want and then do an action accordingly. So there's an example on the actual site, it's like a, it's like a door example where um, there's a custom view called behind this door or something and if it's something then show the door open or show whatever is behind it. I don't know, it's, it's just a means to use state with the view itself. So yeah, this another little cool caveat of um, mainly on clicks. Um, nothing really changes in declaring. Uh, the knife binds. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's a bunch of other uh, listeners associated with the views. So you can have on long click, on item click, and you can read through them. So it's on check, change, and each of these are different. Um, some might have um, a different return value to the method that's required, and some might have a parameter that's required that's not another. So like on check change, I think you have to have a boolean of is it checked or is it not when you in this method right here. Um, so if this was like an on uh, check change, you, you were forced to have a boolean just because that's just the nature of that uh, view event. Um, I'm not sure the little caveats. I don't want to get into all of them because that could take a while. Um, one cool one's on text change. Um, that's kind of if you ever use like a text watcher on a text view, that gets kind of annoying because you have to 
um, use like three different methods with it. It, was just, it, it definitely helps um, condense it a little bit. Um, but yeah, you just have to look at these individual examples and see the different things you can do with them. Uh, but they're all the same general logic. Right. So the, the but uh, no, the last cool thing you could do with uh, uh, Butterknife is resource binding, and uh, I didn't have a before example, but um, it's very similar to views where you have to depending on where you're at in your app, you have to do the get resources method, and you have to do get drawable, and you have to find the drawable view. It's it's very similar looking to how you find views, just a lot of unneeded boilerplate to it. Um, so what Butternut does for you is it will do the body for you. So um, in this case, you got bind drawable, bind color, dimension, and string. Um, pretty much any resource that's in your resource directory can be bind through Butternut to make your life a little bit better. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm missing one. I mean, there's just whatever, any resource that has an R dot value to it is here. <coughs> yeah, it's pretty simple there. Um, so next, I have. I'm going to talk a little bit about event. But any questions about butter knife before I move on? Pretty straightforward. But yeah, nothing. All right. So next, what I want to talk about is event bus, and I'm going to talk about a specific um, event. Bus library. It's actually called Event Bus. Um, wonder why? Uh, it's it's done by the Green Green Robot. Um, it, those are the same people who do um, with the Green Day O. Yeah, Green Day O. I think they do one other one. Um, so yeah, they're they're pretty good. Pretty good at what they do. Um, they say it's inspired by Guava's Event Bus, um, and. It's just a, in general, it's an optimized way, an Android optimized way to simplify communication between different application components. Um, they claim to have this event bus to be the best performance out of anyone out there. Um, I'm not 100% sure, that's just what they claim. I'm, uh, there's no reason for them not to say that, so I'll take it with a grain of salt, but um, I do think statistically their other library, Green Day AO, is the fastest, one of the fastest. So, I mean, they're good at what they do. It's it's a good it's a good library. It's used by many 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 people. I think they said it's like in some ten billion million, I don't know some many billion million apps use it or downloaded apps use it. Um, but there's also other op options for event bus. Uh, so you have auto that's done by the guys at Square, and I think they're a little more heavy on the annotations. Use the annotations to simplify uh, using event buses. Um, not quite sure I haven't used it, um, but it's, they all kind of do the same thing. Um, there's Tiny Bus, um, and then Arcs Java does event busing for you, um, but that's kind of hard to learn if you just want event buses. Um, so unless you want to make the full Rx Java commitment, um, I recommend just using some event bus library. All right, so this general diagram is how event bus work, and I think this is, I mean, this will, how any um, event bus will work is, so you have your publisher. Um, this is the person saying, um, hey, this event happened, um, it, whether something got completed, downloading, or something, you're pulling data from the server, you can say, publisher's gonna say, all right, I need to post this because it's done. Um, so you'll post an event, which will be handled through the event bus. Um, so the event bus is kind of the hub of it all, and you'll see it throughout the next couple slides. Um, it's kind of where all the um, handling of kind of everything starts. Um, so the event bus itself will uh, send out a bunch of events. Um, so it'll find who subscribed. Um, it'll send out this event object to all the subscribers, uh, where each subscriber will need to um, manually subscribe to the event uh, and then an on event method is called which I'll get on call that later but this is the simple, simple diagram of how, how this all works um, yeah. 
So what what good is a vet bus? Why I use a vet bus? Um, it, it's it's very good at decoupling your application. Um, so it, it, the alternative is pass around a bunch of listeners, and that sometimes can get a little hairy, get a little annoying. Um, so you have to do like null checks, make sure the listener is there, and then um, there's a lot of just management that goes along with that that sometimes can get um, in the way of actually developing. And it always come up with a random error at a random time of um, your listener being null for some reason. And um, I don't know. There's there's a lot with that, um, and you need a reference of the thing you pass your listener to, and sometimes that's not very straightforward. Um, and the area I really like is it allows uh, far reaching far reaches of the app to communicate with each other. So they don't technically have to be in the same um, region. I mean, there's really not regions, but the same something can be happen on one side of your app, and anybody far in between can be listening for it and be updating their content accordingly, which um, becomes very useful, um, especially for growing the server. And one thing it does along with the decoupling is it cleans up your code a lot, so you're not passing on all these references, you know, um, it just removes that step of all that janky code. Um, right, so I'm gonna get into a little bit how it works. Uh, so there's four main steps to uh, event bus. You need to define an event, um, you need to have people listening for that event, which you call subscribers, so those people need to be Ready, ready for the event to happen. Um, you need something to post the event uh, when it does happen, and um, you need to actually do the work to receive the event. Um, so then I'm going to step through that, that process. Um, uh, so events uh, are just plain old Java objects. They're events. They're objects that store data that are sent through the system in a little vessel to whoever's listening. Um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's just, uh, there's nothing really special you need to do with events. Um, so you have, this is an example uh, I created. So you'll have your constructor of, okay, when this event happen, um, whatever relevant info you have here. Um, and then all you gotta do is just store it in the event, and um, usually there's getters and setters involved with it. Um, you can do whatever. I, I think you can have whatever name you want on it. It doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, the key thing is just to store the state of the event itself um, to manipulate it how you want it um, beforehand. Uh, yeah, pretty straightforward there. Uh, so. Next step is you need to register, subscriber registration. So any object can receive an event. It's not um, specialized in anything. The only thing you have to do with it is call this um, event bus, call this event, this static class, get default, and then register. Um, this event bus right here is what I was talking about earlier. It's kind of the hub. This is where everything will go through. Um, and then you get the default, it just gets an instance. And then you register whatever object you want. And after this point, this will be officially um, listening for um, that specific. Well, it'll depend. It'll, it'll be listening for events in general. Um, later on, I'll show you how to listen for specific events. But now it's just all events will be passed through um, the object you pass in here. Um, so it'll it'll have it'll at least be considered for it. Um, so subscription lifecycle is, I would say, the biggest challenge of um, event buses because you don't want something listening for events when it's not being used or not on the screen anymore because that'll cause some null pointer exception. that will just cause a bunch of headache to do things that you just don't want to happen. I mean, unless that's what you want to happen, but generally that's not usually the case. Um, so you have to be make sure to call this unregister um, unregistered method or else it will continually be sending it that way and that will just cause headache in the long term uh, for sure. Um, what else? Yeah, so you have the subscribers. So it's something simple like this. So usually if you're using, um, I 
activity or a fragment or something with a life cycle. Um, you can do it on, in the honor zoom when you register for it or on the pause when you unregister. Um, it doesn't have to be there. I just use that example. I mean, a lot of people use it for fragments when it's either destroyed or detached or uh, removed from screen. You just got to make sure to do one and do the other. Um, so it's just, yeah, you can go to run into issues if you forget that. And it's something easy to forget. You just remember to do that. Right, so posting events is simple. Um, so anywhere in your app where an event happens, all you need to do is create this new event object, uh, pass in all the relevant data you have with it, um, uh, all the data with the event, um, and then all you gotta do is call this event bus, get the fault, and then just a simple post with the event itself. Um, there's no naming uh, specification with that. I don't think it has to be event. It could just be whatever name you put on it. Um, the naming issue will come up later uh, when you're actually listening for it. Uh, so that's, that's the key area. So yeah, to receive events, um, you must have an, if, if you're subscribed, you must have an on event method or else it'll crash. Um, it's, it'll, it'll check for that and then it won't like you very much if it doesn't have um, the exact on event text right here. Um, and for it to work, the parameter supposed to be something that's posted. So if you have some random object in here, it won't receive it ever. Ooh, not to do that. Um, so you have some random object. So it has to be the exact object that you're posting. So in this case, it's the important event. Um, uh, yeah. So this is the key way where you specify how to listen for different events. So everything listening for an event uh, will have this on event method, but if you have just say one fragment has three different types of events to listen for, the only thing that's going to change is um, the params itself and the, and the uh, objects in the parameters of the on event method. And that's how you specify um, the different events within any given object. So, yeah, so once, once you get the on event, passed in, you can do whatever you want with the event that's passed through and the data that's associated with it. Um, I'm just logging it, logging it on here. Um, so yeah, when to use event buses. Um, this is kind of a I mean, hard thing to, to really visualize, but like when there's a medium to high distance of components in your app, um, so just say you kick off a service somewhere else that's going to look for a bunch of data in your database and other things are happening so there's creating kind of a separation between um, the data you're grabbing and where you want to display it um, so it creates kind of like a you know medium to high distance of components so that way once the data is loaded you, your app will be doing other stuff and then um, the object will still be listening for it and updating it accordingly um, so the main areas, like I've said a couple times, is network and database calls. Database calls, not so much, if you um, really depending on what you're doing with the database calls. If you're doing some crazy complex, complex queries on a huge database, then maybe um, that's where it gets a little more useful because Android um, database systems are a little bit slower um, than you, what you'd get like on a server, but uh, a lot slower. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, but the main one is network calls. That's, uh, I feel like, one of the key use cases. Um, one area I like to use it is updating stater appearance of the views. So um, this mainly relates to using custom views. So just say you have um, two custom views, um, kind of side by side, um, but then the whatever happens in the one on the right affects the one on the left. Um, it's a very easy way to say, okay, if this happens, on the right, this is pressed on the right, and um, adjust the color or text on the one on the left. Um, there's other ways of doing that, but this is a very um, easy and straightforward way of doing that because you don't um, need to connect them in any way except for having uh, you know, the, all the event stuff. You just subscribe it and send the event. It's an easy way to um, keep necessary view state as it should be. Um, 
you got a few different UI components, um, whatever that. Anybody else use it? Has any other use cases or broadcasting? Just speak up a little bit, sir. Broadcasting. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. It's good to use. Somebody else use it for anything different? Um, Talking between activities. Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah. So you can't pass plain old Java objects or listeners or anything like that right. to more activities. Especially frag and the same on the same note fragments. If you have them side by side, it's a very easy way just to communicate between them. Because the alternative is you have to have this just pass around listeners all over the place and that can be a headache. So yeah, that's good. That's good. Good call. Um, I think that was okay. So any questions on event bus before I move on? I'm kinda of going through this kind of quick. I do be on time. Uh, in 25 minutes. All oh, right, well, I'm flying. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to end a little early. So uh, this last one is the support annotation library. And, um, so this is a little bit newer. Um, it's essentially, it doesn't, I can't think of a way to describe it. It's, it's not, it doesn't necessarily add a huge amount of functionality like butter knife or event bus, but it's a way, a great way to um, maintain your code, especially in a large team uh, with multiple people working on it or handling APIs or just building a library that people are going to contribute on. Um, and I think it's kind of cool. I think it's really cool. And I think um, there could potentially be some good uses for it um, later on. So now I've started implementing this in my code just to make sure just to make sure I'm not messing up any part. So, so what it is, essentially using annotations to um, constrain your code. So in this case, you can say, um, put the annotation for this method for the return value as non-null. So what that means is, and I think you can adjust this in Android Studio, but it's not a fatal issue here, but you can see it's the null for this method is highlighted. I can see that one. But no, it, it's um, it's highlighted uh, so that it, what it says is it says you know this, this is specified as not null and it's null. What are you doing wrong? What's the deal? Um, so it's a good way to just maintain that throughout your app. And then you can also deal with parameters. So you can say this first nullable string. Okay, this one's okay if it's null. I mean, it's not a big deal. Um, handling it, I'm dealing with it in the method. Um, I don't feel like anybody else needs to be warned about this. Um, but you also can have the alternative of non-null. Um, so this might be more important data that's very crucial to this method's functionality. Um, so what will happen is the same type of thing for the return value. Um, you'll have this little notification saying, hey, this shouldn't be null. Why is it null? You're doing something wrong. Um, and that way, it's a great way to verify your code. Um, if you're passing something that null, it shouldn't be. And uh, it's just a great way to keep uh, things clean. Uh, so the next thing, uh, which I really like, is uh, you have the resource type annotation. Um, so these are more um, parameters annotations. Uh, so this first one, I have a string resource uh, with a string ID. So that same ID that you look up at the r dot string dot hello world, I don't know using an app name or hello world. Um, it's, it's that specific ID, uh, which is kind of a long, I think it's eight or nine digits long. I'm not sure what the length is, but it's some extended uh, ID to it. Um, so you can use this for any resource. Uh, you can use it for a drawable, anything that has an ID that you can look it up. That's a resource at the same time. Um, so. This is, so I have this calling method up here. If I call set title um, with, so this first uh, parameter, the string, it matches the string resources, and it says, okay, cool, this is a string resource. But if the second one, if I pass in the second one that's not a drawable resource, um, it will actually 
uh, look up in your uh, file system and it'll look up not just if that ID itself exists, but if that ID is within the drawable resources. Um, so, yeah, which is really useful. And then it also works just for any random number you pass in there. So this is very nice if you're if you're passing in string IDs or drawable resources IDs, and uh, you just want to keep it clean and avoid errors that are related to that. Say what? Yep. Is this compile time or runtime? Compile. Compile. It's all ID based. And it's all this. That 32 was a perfect big set of This is very recent. Yeah. I think it's really, it's really cool. It's, it's, I think if there's a lot in the future where they're going to take it. Um, or, but, uh, it's cool. um, so another cool feature is threading. So you can specify either if you uh, if you have a worker thread, um, which means background thread, or you can have a main thread annotation, or I think the, it's interchangeable with the UI thread annotation. I think they did, I was looking this up yesterday and didn't have a clear difference between the two, so I just use main thread. The UI thread is the main thread in Android, but um, anyhow, same point. So um, in this calling method up here, I'm creating this async task, which, if you don't know, uh, creates a background thread. So I have these two methods. I have the do main thread stuff, and then I have the do background thread stuff. And as you can th see, the do main thread stuff, there's a fatal issue with that. Your, your, your app won't compile. Um, it won't run uh, because you're calling a method that shouldn't be done in the background thread in the background thread. Um, but then as you see, the do background stuff is perfectly fine because it's annotated as it should be. So this, this comes um, in handy with you know, making sure you're calling things at the right time and um, all, that, all that good stuff. Uh, the, those annotations, are those Android annotation, annotations? Cause that the worker thread and the main thread? Because right. you're saying, are you just, uh, how do you know that that's happening in the main thread and that's happening in the worker thread? I mean, you should. Based on the annotations? What do you, I, I don't know. You specify that, right? Right. So if you're like touching view code, you'd put a at main thread over it, because you're touching view code. So right. are you saying that those are built in? Yeah. Those are in the support annotations. Oh, library. those two right. things are? Okay. Yeah. And in a lot of view components, um, these annotations are spread out everywhere. So if you call, I think, what was the example? If you call a set text, of a view in the doing background, it will throw up the can't do this. Um, so they're, they're, I think, pretty much should be everywhere or in a lot of places at this point, but they're starting to spread it all over the framework code, which is really cool, prevent people from doing um, stupid stuff when they, where they shouldn't be. Um, right. Um, and there's one other one of these, it's like the uh, binder, that binder thread. Or binder, something with a binder. I never, I don't know, I didn't really know what to do with this, so I don't want to talk on it. But there is one more if you ever use binders. I think it's more something to do with services and that. Um, so, yeah, that's really useful. Um, one thing I think is really cool is you can specify ranges uh, that you want. So, um, for this first one, the foot range, you know, you all you gotta do is set the from 0, 0.0 to. 1.0, um, so very useful, very useful percents, or when you're dealing with a lot with like uh, colors or uh, any of that type of stuff that just has this fixed range, uh, it really opens up, uh, really constrains the methods to these specific uh, values. Um, so that's the example. This bottom one, the it range from 0 to 255, that's uh, useful coloring. Um, so yeah, so if you, if you pass in yeah. Um, yeah. So if you pass in something within it, it'll be fine with it. And then if you pass something without of it, um, it'll get really mad at you and won't let you run. So yeah, that's fine. Do what? Is there a string format thing? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> You think 
confusing yeah. variables? Yeah, because right now Right. Not sure. I mean, it should. Yeah, it should do everything it could. So, pretty cool there. Um, so, other annotations, uh, you can annotate a method to make sure it's called in the superclass, um, which comes in handy. Um, I think this require permissions one is uh, something moving forward with M. I think that's the means of, it's just a way of um, saying that if you're using location, you put that on the method, okay, this. We we'll need this, and I think I think that's gonna be one more use when you uh, with the change of permissions. Um, and then one I really like is visible for testing, so you can you can have a method uh, with this annotation to where you normally couldn't use it, um, if it's private or whatever. It'll make it more visible for when you're actually testing it, um, which can be a headache sometimes when you're testing. So yeah, and then more on the way. I'm not sure exactly which ones, but um, I can see. Why not using this for a bunch of different little areas moving forward? Um, I'm kind of excited to see where it goes. I think it's a cool way to keep the code clean and keep it just um, kind of forget about those errors that normally could happen just for random occurrences. So, yeah, looking forward to where that's going. And that's all I had. So.